Good morning, everybody. My name is Emily Jackson. I'm the SVP of Sustainability at The Economist Group. And this session, we're going to be looking at how CFOs and CSOs should work together to de-risk their ESG strategy. The purpose of this panel is, is to look at how you're collaborating together. Maybe let's put this conversation in context. The world is reeling from record-breaking heat waves, wildfires, rainfall, floods have ravaged northern China. There have been wildfires cutting through Canada, Greece, um, Hawaii, and there's been a significant human toll from these disasters, but also an economic impact. And the Brookings Institute said that a number of companies, or half of companies, tend to look at decarbonization, the cost of decarbonization within their companies, but they are not significantly focusing on, on the risks and talking about the physical impacts of climate change. So I'm looking forward to looking at how this panel is managing ESG-related risks and opportunities, how you can collaborate together to do that, and the solutions and services that are available to set these objectives. So I'd like to welcome Ulrika Sapiro, the Chief Sustainability Officer at Henkel, Maggie Buggy, Chief Operating Officer at Normative, Rebecca Marmot, Chief Sustainability Officer at Unilever, Andy Ag, Chief, Group Chief Financial Officer at National Grid, and Rishi Kalra, Group Chief Financial Officer at OFI. The panel description starts with the point that sustainability should be woven into every facet of an organization, and there should be a purposeful collaboration between the sustainability and finance teams. And I want to start first with the CSO perspective on that, and then we'll look at the CFO perspective. So, Rebecca, what is the case in, at Unilever? How does, how does this actually work in practice, and is everybody on the same page when you look at sustainability and finance? So, yeah, mo morning, everybody. Um, so I would say five years ago, you know, the interaction was, can you please check this before it goes into the annual report, and can we have some case studies, and et cetera, et cetera. And maybe there were some conversations around um, and we just heard the panel talking about it, short-term versus long-term. Now, our two functions are completely and utterly interwoven. So what with the work that we've done at Unilever around sustainability, we've tried very, very hard to embed it into the core of what we're doing. So we have, for example, a shared metrics committee, which is myself uh, and either the CFO or our head of non-financial reporting, uh, Lizanne Gray. And what we do when we're making any commitment in the ESG space and sustainability is approach it in exactly the same way with the same rigor and, and, and structure that you would have in financial reporting. So we establish a basis of prep, we look at what are we going to measure, how will we report on it. We co-chair, as I said, a metrics committee to look at that work. We've done an awful lot of work together over the past particularly two or three years on input into things like TCFD, how do we standardize reporting metrics on, on non-financial reporting, all the work together on input to the ISSB, trying to decide how do we approach new European regulations, everything coming out of the SEC. So you know, it, it's very much two sides of a coin. Um, and I think because of that, and because of that, that structure and rigor that we've brought to the process, it's enabled us to much more easily mm -hmm. embed um, across the business. And I'd say you know, the, the, other, the other area as well is really making sure, again, on lots of process work, things like our risk register on corporate audit, that we're approaching it in exactly the same way as historically you would have done around financial risks. So a big part of it is risk mitigation and, and, and cost reduction. And then, of course, all the positive part, which is about proactively how do you communicate this, really working together on, on things like standard setting. And Henkel is still a largely owned family business. What is the difference there? I mean, how, how does sustainability and finance work, to, uh, work together? And is it, is it different to Unilever? Yeah, I think we have probably two builds from, uh, from what Rebecca said. One is it's still very largely a family-run business, but also on the DAX. It's also publicly listed. And it's also a consumer goods company, but the other half is technologies for industries. Yeah? So it's a very two very different businesses as well, which also, of course, play into how a company is, is running its governance and how it is running ultimately also... Um, uh, sustainability and finance. Um, and I'd like to, I, I always like to see, a, a sort of bring a bit of a flip side to, to what Rebecca said, and we'll he hear a lot of very, very good examples and best practices. But I think the reality uh, in the CFO, CSO, or sustainability and finance relationship is still very much, I would say, largely 
the one of two worlds, right? You have on one side, on the finance <coughs> side, a lot of structure, a lot of certainty, at least, you know, believed. Um, you have clear definitions, the KPIs are clear, the processes are established, you have the IT system, and you really know what you're reporting on the dot. Sustainability, um, compared to that, seems very messy. You have evolving methodologies, you have gap of data or lack of quality data, you don't have really the IT systems very often, so we'll hear some about that, I'm sure. Um, and, you don't necessarily, and you don't have an integrated function very often that brings you the data from the business. You have to have a whole ecosystem of players in the business, in procurement, uh, HR, to actually suck the data up together. So that is a very different world, and it leads to, I think, a lot of also cultural exchange that, that needs to happen in an organization between two organizations. Sometimes really think we're speaking two different languages, and we still have to understand what the other one is actually saying. But at the end of the day, I think, Rebecca, what you also um, quite clearly highlighted is it's the, the common ground is that we want to manage the cost of doing business <coughs> and the cost of regulation in the mid to long term uh, in the most beneficial way for the company. That's where we really meet. We want to reduce and manage disruption that is coming uh, to the business. And I think ESG and the perspective of ESG is giving an additional material of thinking around disruption for a business. And of course, we want to have the business grow and so to meet customer and consumer expectation, which are very much uh, accelerating with ESG. So this is the common ground you have to work on and you actually can build on to make that translation happen. And, and all of that should then hopefully build trust with investors to give you their money and invest in your company, whether it's family owned or publicly listed, to actually trust in what you're doing is the right thing. And that's the big joint challenge for, for sustainability and finance and how we are all feeding that into and with each other. And we have a lot to learn from each other. So bringing more rigor, I suppose, and more process into sustainability. On the other side, a broader perspective and perhaps a bit more long-term thinking as well, serious long-term thinking and ambiguity um, and resilience into finance. So the structure and the mess are both needed to take Correct. the organization <laughs> forward. <laughs> so let's turn to the, the CFO. The CFO is responsible in the organization for financial action. You have a huge influence or drive investment decisions and, and strateg strategic decisions within the organization. And maybe picking up on Ulrika's point, how do you collaborate with sustainability and do you see that as a, a messy structure or do you see it as is required for your job? I mean, how do you collaborate with sustainability? Andy. Okay. No, um, morning, everybody. Um, I, I think I'd start where Rebecca did, which is if you asked that question five years ago, it was absolutely starting as two different worlds. Um, but I think, you know, over the last few years, there, and there's been a couple of real accelerators that I've seen. So TCFD probably was the first time uh, I think there was a great realization that the value that could be brought by bringing finance and sustainability more closely together. And to the point around you know, the risks of the, that the company's facing, how you articulate those in the same way you do other financial risks, I think that all uh, TCFD was a real you know, uh, platform to bring that together. I think there's hugely complementary skills, uh, as, as finance does in many other parts of what it has to do. It, it, it never has all the knowledge, and therefore it has to work with all parts of the organization. So in a way, the CSO function is just another critical part of the wider organization that, that we need to work with, with to be successful. But I think finance then also brings, you know, probably decades of experience in terms of process and controls and, and, and governance, which, to take the point, I, I think the CSO function may not always welcome, but actually they, they recognize that to really get this done uh, and embed this is, is going to be critical. And then for a company like, like National Grid, where, you know, sustainability is critical, not just to how we report and, and engage with investors, but actually fundamental to what we need to do in, in the energy sector. I think really get, getting this embedded in everything we do, the language that we talk about, how we measure our performance, has been a, a, a real success journey over the last few years. More to do, a lot more to do, uh, but, but great progress. So Rishi, five years ago, something seems to have happened that I'm not entirely clear <laughs> what it was. <laughs> was it the same for you? And how do you, I mean, OFI is particularly affected by the climate risks we were talking about earlier. So you know, things like droughts, flooding, wildfires. So, how, what's your approach, and, and did you have that watershed moment five years ago? <laughs> yeah, no, thank you, and uh, good morning, everybody. I, I think uh, before I head there, let me explain what our business is, because it will help set the context on why probably we were a little ahead of the journey. So we are a global uh, leader at the forefront of uh, food ingredient uh, and beverage solutions. Uh, 
people don't know us because we're not a brand, we're not consumer facing, but our business really is across 50 plus countries. Mm -hmm. And all of you in this room and beyond uh, eat us consumers every day, but not as a brand. So every uh, fifth bar of chocolate will have our cocoa. We do enough coffee that we can serve a cup of coffee to every coffee drinker in the world once a month. That's the size and scale of operations. So for us, uh, sustainability was not only uh, good to have, it was a must have. If we didn't do it and things that you touched upon, Emily, earlier on, our business would have finished. If we don't work with the communities right, if we don't have the right productivity and yields, which is what we are seeing through climate change and otherwise, we didn't even have a business to operate. So for us, the whole sustainability linkage was clearly coming from a commercial sense as a corporate and we all, at least I work for a commercial organization and there is, unless you can make a commercial value from it, there is no way it can become sustainable. So early on when most companies were touching upon and speaking of CSR departments, uh, we felt that was probably just keeping a budget to spend. That was not us. We decided it has to be CR and S, corporate responsibility and sustainability. And the only way it can be sustainable is if you can find a commercial linkage. And that's where it comes along finance. <laughs> what you can't measure, you can't track. Uh, reporting aside, you can't even influence change and behavior. I had my Damascus moment in different form, and this was uh, in this space for a finance professional to have been in this journey for 10 odd years is a very long period. I, I have seen many people. There are more uh, participants now, but 10 years back, it was far and few. But we felt the need more to understand the impact, bring the same rigor that uh, everybody in the panel has touched upon. Can we bring the same rigor of finance and accounts to sustainability as well? Because if we don't have uh, numbers speak a language, if we can report in a form which speaks a language, every business person will understand it. And uh, set together a team, uh, uh, especially in this area, called Finance for Sustainability. It was a separate group of people working directly with me. And they came out with a brilliant uh, dashboard called Integrated Impact Statement. It was not about integrated reporting. It was, as we would make financial accounts, what is the impact on natural capital, social capital, and human capital? Presented in a form, dollars and cents, in p and and balance sheet form. So people started appreciating the actions on the ground and the impacts thereof, which is where we also started seeing value coming in. And that value can come in from customers. Can you... I explain that business better and today when uh, most customers are making their commitments towards net zero and beyond, they need likes of us who've had years of tracking all this because data is really at the core. If you don't have the right data, most of this is garbage. Even we find it challenging despite having been in this journey for very long, uh, data processes systems are still the most complex and methodologies also keep evolving. But, but to be put it, try to summarize it, I think the journey has been long, longer than most. We have the same challenges, but till the time you bring the same rigor of finance and account, which is where finance teams play a big role, mm. uh, you can't really influence change. Mm. And Maggie, picking up on that point about the challenge of, of data and bringing together data in a way that's meaningful for the, for the C-suite, how, how are you seeing when organizations are coming to you, how the functions are actually collaborating together or not, mm. and what the you know, one side versus the other? <laughs> yes, I mean, I'm loving the discussion here because it's like, a, it's, um, it, the discussion really reflects the full kind of spectrum of conversation that I have day to day. And uh, I would say that the thing that has really been the catalyst for the integration of CSOs and CFOs working together and converging around making great sustainable decisions based on trusted data, it comes down to one thing. As the fact that boards of directors have woken up globally. And uh, agnostic to the regulation itself, of course, that has driven um, a lot of the initial move, because we all know once compliance gets involved, well, everybody has to get in line. But more importantly, boards have woken up to the fact that doing this well and embedding sustainability management into normal business operations is fundamentally about fulfilling our stewardship responsibilities for the firms that we're responsible for, for the people who work in them, for the customers they serve, for the suppliers that they support, for the ecosystems they support. Um, and also as part of that, and I loved Ulrika's point around the messiness, but I'm a big believer that chaos is the best market time ever because times of chaos represent the times of biggest possibility and opportunity, and that big shift around understanding, yes, the company has to be compliant around how it's engaging with this data and um, complying with legislation, but really, if we collectively get this right, what we're looking at is the start of the biggest shift in an understanding of what returning shareholder value actually means, what building sustainability means, pro pro preserving the integrity of the P&L means, what you know, being able to attract and retain customer means in future, and mm. therefore, 
access to data and making good uh, decisions on accurate trusted data sets. And yes, also bringing together the kind of activism and deep understanding and passion that I love seeing exhibited in, in CSOs, together then with the rigor and like focus on, okay, but how do we translate this into actionable plans? And how, we how do we delegate responsibility for our sustainability uh, returns in general, and I would say carbon in particular, into distributed P&Ls across the various functions and into middle management to therefore support better decision making, but most importantly, when then, you know, Rishi or Andy are then rolling that up and, you know, collating all the data ready for the annual reporting, it's embedded in the business. And also, this is fundamentally about business change. And I think that if we collectively can think about it in that way, we'll actually get to net zero faster and also create sustainable businesses and great friends out of CSOs and CFOs. You've all talked about financial and non-financial information and, and the challenge around reporting that in a, in a meaningful way. And the topics around, if we're looking at risk, you know, degradation of natural capital, you were just talking about that. Risks around biodiversity, information that is not always easy to express in financial terms. And Rebecca, how do you get over that challenge? And you've still got your fiduciary duty on one side, but you're trying to you know, communicate that you have these risks in your business and you're needing to deal with them on the other. Now, how do you effectively communicate that with your shareholders? So I think what we try to do around a business case on sustainability is, is split that into growth, trust, risk, and cost. And I think it, it's, sometimes there's a perception or there's a, um, a misperception. You know, this is just a sunk cost and actually, you know, it needs to be written off. But actually, and you know, you talked about it, Rishi. From a risk mitigation perspective, it's hugely important. So we've done a raft of different um, pieces of research over the past few years, looking at the impact of climate change at you know, different levels across various parts of our supply chain. So where we source and, and what we source, the, the raw materials, particularly the, the crops and commodities, are massively influenced by climate change. So mm. it's, it's a straightforward risk mitigation strategy. You know, we, we need to invest in that. We need to think about drip irrigation. We're spending a lot of time and energy at the moment on shifting to regenerative agriculture. Mm. You know, how can we change the way um, that we're growing, uh, wetting and drying, for example, in things like rice? Sometimes it's just straightforward cheaper. So you know, shifting to renewable energy is, is, is cheaper. I think where um, sometimes you get the question is if you're investing uh, and it is, you know, the, the return is going to be a little bit longer, but actually building trust is hugely important. And particularly as a consumer facing company, you know, we know and that, you know, there's a, this is, there's a, there's a sort of um, idea, oh, this is just young people uh, in the developed world who care about sustainability. It's, it's just not the case at all. You know, many people around the world, for different reasons and for different drivers, realise the impact that climate change is having on the environment where they're living, or how, you know, how and what is the expectation of bridging social equity. So building trust is crucially, crucially important. And we've seen that as well. You, know, you talk about fiduciary responsibility. The expectation now on boards to take action on sustainability mm. is huge. We launched a, a climate transition action plan. We took that to our AGM to an advisory vote three years ago. We'll take the revised version again next year. I think you know, that transparency is, is really, really important. Um, and finally, you know, on a positive, part, positive perspective, it, it can grow the business as well. You know, we know when we put sustainability initiatives front and center of a consumer-facing activation that it better, better resonates with consumers. So mm. we've just launched, for example, in the UK, Purcell have just launched. Mm. It's like a little cardboard box um, and you get one sheet uh, which you put in the washing machine and, and that's instead of having, you know, what we used to all use, massive big box of powder, which, you know, I think it was Kate was mentioning before, you know, that the, the, the cost of that, the, the carbon footprint of that is huge. You know, obviously it's fossil fuel derived carbon that's going into things like laundry detergents. So actually one little sheet in a recyclable cardboard box is hugely beneficial when it comes to, to putting sustainability front and center of the innovation process and it helps to grow the business yeah. um, so when we're looking across you know growing sectors we see that when we put sustainability yeah. front and center that really resonates there's an interesting question here just building on what you're saying so if you're looking at an initiative that the, the lowers the cost but also lowers the carbon impact you know, for Rishi from Sam King how critical were putting a, call, a dollar amount against a sustainability impact when you're working between the CSO and CFO. I mean, it's, 
How, do, how does that work in practice, that you're looking at an initiative and you quantify the impact that it's going to have? Yeah, no, it's, that makes life easy. Actually, numbers, like I said, speak a language better than anything else. Uh, we all appreciate dollars and cents, and we know the impacts when quantified better. I'll probably use an example which uh, might help in uh, uh, explaining this better. It'll, it normally resonates with most people when I explain it. Uh, we all uh, uh, know bees, and bees are a big pollinator, but people think it is a pot of honey. But uh, if there was no bees, Einstein had once said there'd be no human race. It was as extreme as that. We, are, uh, we farm a lot, and we, have, uh, we are probably the largest corporate farmers of almonds in the world, in Australia and California. And we get every year a lot of uh, beehive owners to bring bees on a farm to ensure that they pollinate properly. Uh, we've been paying millions of dollars every year for them to be brought to our farms. But we were seeing that the productivity and yields were going down. Uh, and you can ascribe it on uh, biodiversity, you can ascribe it on Mother Earth, you can't do anything about it. Uh, and just because you pay more money, you can probably get uh, employees to work more, but you can't get bees to work harder. <laughs> they, they weren't doing what they were supposed to do. So we worked with some of our other partners, uh, corporates and NGOs, and set up on our uh, orchards a natural habitat for the bees. It was, one would have thought it was an investment uh, or an expense. From a financial accounts, it was expense, but from our standpoint, it became an investment in the way we look at integrated impact reporting. And the productivity and yield on our farms and orchards went up many fold. So clearly they need a natural habitat. Uh, so initially when CSOs or any of these projects come along and they may be considered as an expense, you won't take the right action. But if you start appreciating the dollar linkage of the value proposition thereof, then things become much easier. Then you can explain it easier. And once the value is back in, you can start recycling that cash too. So one thing leads to the other. I think we started small and started early. But that whole linkage to numbers, one, the dialogue with CSOs become much better, but more importantly, whether it's at board levels, investors, anybody you want to speak to, you can explain in numbers, which really resonate better than anything else. Mm. Yeah. And National Grid is a completely different type of organization. When you look at, and again, picking up from one of the questions here, I'm interested in following on to that point, how are you measuring the added value of initiatives that you're introducing to, to the National Grid? I mean, how do you look at it and report on that? Yeah, I, th I think when you stand back and look at what are the key things we can do as National Grid to uh, the, the journey to net zero, which is the, the primary focus of, of what we look at, there's things that we could, you know, scope one, scope two internally, but there's also what can we do in terms of the wider economy and then how we transition both the UK and the northeast of the US and to, to, towards net zero. Um, and so we look at a lot of our investments, and, and we touched on sort of uh, investment programs, how we factor carbon pricing into those um, are they, it, it, one of the big programs we're working on at the moment is, as part of the 40 billion pounds we're investing, is, is allowing the UK to hit its 50 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. Now, of course, we, we, need, we need the wind, the generation to come along as well, but we, we need to make sure as National Grid that the transmission is available by, the, by that date to, to allow that generation to come onto the network. Um, and that's a huge number of projects, a huge amount of investment but working with the, the wider industry, the supply chain, uh, making sure the supply chain is developing as well to, to deliver those types of projects. So for us, it's, it's absolutely some of these internal examples, but it's also what can we do to invest in the, the infrastructure that's going to enable the rest of the economy. Uh, and, and also when we measure total emissions for the UK and the northeast of the US, that's one of the most powerful things that, that we can do. We can't do it alone, uh, but, but, but that's uh, absolutely where we, we go. And, so there are other things, you know, if you look across our network, uh, one of the legacy issues we have is the, is the gas that's used to insulate our switch gear, how we, we operate the system and we, we switch, you know, uh, assets on and off. But historically, that's a very polluting gas, uh, SF6. So we're working very closely with innovative engineering firms to, for a, a, a green replacement for that gas that will work at a very high transmission voltage. And that, that's... That's going to be a massive step. Uh, there are early good signs, but again, agreeing with our regulators how quickly we can then roll that out across the network. So it's things like that that, that add value to the, the, the sector as a whole. Yeah. So we've been talking about ESG-related risks and opportunities, how they can drive value, but how the business has to manage them. And you were talking about this, the relationship between the CFO and the CSO and how that you know, can can and cannot <laughs> work. So how, how, when you're making a business case for initiatives, does that come from the CSO office? Does it come from the strategic part of the business? I mean, how, does, how do you make the business case that it's, that's clear and it makes sense for, for Henkel? Yeah. 
I mean, I found when I, and I only joined Henkel two and a half years ago, so I'm still relatively new uh, in the company, but what I found when I arrived was actually really gold dust in this context, which is we just had launched or were just about to launch the company purpose or a revised company purpose, which really was carrying also the message of innovation and sustainability, yeah? so pioneers at heart for the good of generations, which was very much bringing the family belief uh, into that. So it was, of course, a fantastic stepping stone to build out uh, from. Secondly, the business growth strategy for the next 10 years had sustainability at its heart, next to innovation and digitalization, which is, for me, the perfect place for it to be. And again, another build that you can actually really drive from. And on that, that basis, we developed our new sustainability strategy, yeah? and very much involving the board, the executive committee, and of course, all the business uh, leaders in this, and developing it together so everybody had skin in the game. Um, and I think that was a very, very important base for then to drive your targets, hold people accountable, and build out from more long-term on ambitions. Now, when you ask, okay, you still have to make choices, right? Every year, every day, do you put your money here or do you put it there? And how do you manage trade-offs? And in particular, ESG are very different very things, different. right? It's a lot of environmental topics. We mm. touched on climate. We have a circular economy. We have nature issues came up as well. Social is a range of topics that uh, in an industry, particularly agricultural, but also chemical in the widest sense, has a lot of uh, individual different issues um, in your own business, in the supply chain, in communities. And then the governance piece as well, like product safety, transparency, supplier col collaboration. So to, to make those choices and have those trade-offs and say you still make progress on the most um, important things, we basically started to look at um, those choices, but also back to the point of data, because you make better choices if you have better data. Mm -hmm. So the investment behind the right data to make the right choices was really in three steps or three areas. One is, of course, to ensure compliance and manage risks. And compliance, we just heard it on the panel before, or before, um, is, is increasing. So, the, I mean, keeping up with, with, with just regulation is, is not a trivial task either. So that, that compliance piece is important. The second part is cost efficiency and cost optimization. Example on carbon prices, right? How do you anticipate as you're investing, as you are doing your M&A? But also very simply, any company that has packaging on the market, like partly ours does and, and certainly Unilever as well, there are increasing and accelerating cost curves for packaging. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you actually make that not only transparent, but you can also steer and, and manage it actively? That's a very much of a financial equation, even though it's called sustainability. And then the last, um, last level, not the last, but the, the highest complexity and the most value add is, of course, market differentiation, right? Mm -hmm. If you can actually bring sustainability to the consumer, um, to, to claim, to tell him what he wants to hear and then choose your product or to the customer. And we have fantastic opportunities as we, as I said, we have an industrial technologies business, which is basically selling um, adhesive technologies into shoes. Yeah, and to your mobile phone is glued, the sealants in your electric bat uh, vehicle batteries, uh, for your wind turbines. I mean, with all the sectors here, our adhesives business is a very, very small part of what you produce, but it can actually be a technology enabler to completely redesign your product or your processes and hence decarbonize. And that's where the real holy grail is for, for moving the added value of sustainability. So lots of different approaches. And one thing I think is interesting is that there's there's no real consistency. Every company has followed its own path based on the sector that it's in and, and the challenges that it's facing internally. I mean, Maggie, when you're looking or working with companies, do you, is that a challenge that, that there is the, the types of data that's, that are being collected or looked at or there's ways that companies are approaching it are all different? Or how do you unify that mm -hmm. with, as, as Ulrika is saying, the key Yes. is having the data and being able to leverage that. Yes, I would say that like there is convergence around the categories of data. A lot are driven by the requirements of the legislation that was mentioned a lot on the previous panels. I know it's going to be a big topic later today. And also the answer goes straight to the heart of one of the questions here as well around best practices and also the incentives on paybacks. And one of the ways in which uh, many of our customers kind of decide where to start beyond just getting an accurate number one is accurate baseline across scope one, two, and three. 
emissions, ideally delivered by an automated software platform and one that like, is constantly applying the latest emergent legislation and that also is a portable baseline in case the company wants to change, change provider over time. Because that's one of the challenges in this space that many of our customers have been trapped in other uh, platforms. Um, but once they've done that, next then becomes, okay, but how do we keep the main thing the main thing? Because we all know most companies uh, don't have the luxury of being, you know, drowning in cash and can just, you know, uh, fund any initiative. Instead, then, uh, most of our customers are spending a lot of time co-creating with the various, various business functions. And then with the um, CSO always and their departments as change agents and experts within that process. In that, if I'm a chief marketing officer, you know, I don't necessarily want to talk about sustainability in general. I want to talk about it in the context of what is it, how is it going to influence the key business metric of return on marketing investment, which is what I, as a CMO, am measured on on behalf of the board. Secondly, I want to understand how am I going to account for and apply sustainability insights and data into uh, brand equity. If I'm a chief procurement officer, I want to know how useful is that uh, and um, trusted data set going to be for me to manage my procure to pay process and for me to be able to compete. And like the list goes on, and you know, Elrika mentioned you know, industrials and complex manufacturing. One of the most exciting spaces that a lot of our customers are starting with is applying sustainability uh, data into the core business process of design to operate. And the beauty around the convergence in that approach is that you're not introducing a whole load of new metrics into the business. Instead, it allows finance um, professionals and also functional professionals to understand what does this mean for me. And that's very much what I would call out as some of the best practice that we see across our customer base. The companies that are spending the time internally to broker the conversation and provide that space for people to, yes, ask the sometimes silly question. Because I think that what a lot of um, non-sustainability functional experts say to me, from the most senior to the most junior, is that sometimes the space is a bit impenetrable. Like, there's so many acronyms, like it's fraught with um, you know, new information. So our customers that are keeping it very simple, that are breaking it down into, what does this mean in terms of fulfilling our sustainability objectives and our stewardship responsibilities? And secondly, what short-term opportunities and cost savings exist? You know, one of my favorite case studies that we have is from Eltel, a Nordic um, a telecom service provider. They were on, get on their net zero journey. Brilliant, they were able to do that. But in terms of short-term payback and also educating internally about the financial impact of these initiatives is that Focusing on their reduction journey allowed them to switch to uh, their, their whole fleet to, um, to renewables, to electric, which delivered a massive cost saving because this happened at the time when the cost of oil was over $100 a barrel. So their CFO was, of course, very happy with that. And the other thing I would mention is that the companies who are really moving the dial over time and are addressing the, some of the short-termism that can be perceived in the space is that they're linking this to long-term executive pay. Right. You know, we know that 70% of FTSE listed companies, oh, across, across the 250, over 70% of CFOs and CEOs there have got components of uh, driving sustainability impact. And I know from the FTSE board I sit on, that is also the case as well. Yeah. I'll just call those out as best practice in a specific right. example. So Rika was just talking about the fact that when we're talking about risks and opportunities, it's the ES and the G. And Rishi, you've, you've, it's clear that you need to manage all of that. There's a business imperative to manage the ESG-related risks. And picking up on that question, because I am quite interested in, in that fine one, final one, is how do you make decisions that may be negative in the short term, um, but will drive long-term, you know, it's a long-term, it's a good decision for the business but you still need to protect cash and profit today. I mean, how do you actually do that in practice? Are there examples that you could maybe share with us? Yeah, no, it's, a, it's a very interesting question and probably one of the most debated one in boardrooms. So for, and from a shareholder standpoint, what really matters most? So I think it, is, uh, it goes back to the philosophy of uh, what are you in business for? So I think we all will appreciate, agree. Uh, we are here to create value for the shareholders, stakeholders but can't only be shareholders, it's stakeholders as well. And there are multiple stakeholders in the whole ecosystem that you operate within. 
and you can create value by doing good as well, which is the other aspect. Uh, it's a slow process, but if you can demonstrate that long-term value finally translates into short-term earnings as well, life becomes easier. Uh, early on, it will be difficult, but uh, if I put a framework around the kind of business that we are in, we have uh, uh, set our pathways and targets and metrics on what we'll focus upon. For us, uh, farmers and communities are right at the heart of it. Uh, if we don't have the right uh, farmers working with us or the communities who really believe us as being partners to them, we don't even get the producer, so it becomes an easier sell. We have to make the sustainable choices, but we also have to ensure that we have regenerative agriculture and things that we work with some of our customers like Unilever as well, because that is where we can make the biggest impacts. So then you start realizing and appreciating your material areas and where you can make an impact, and how can that create value for you and your customers. Finally, somebody has to pay it back. Uh, consumers will, uh, will have to contend with it. But if you are doing good, uh, it is very well demonstrated that it also creates value. Mm. Not only the long term, in the medium term, and slowly, steadily, when you're in a cycle of churn, then it starts coming to your PL also and cash flows on a regular basis. And we use some of this through uh, monetizing as well. So when we, I touched upon, we have a CSO function, a sustainability function. We have a finance for sustainability function. And more recently, I've actually appointed a CFO sustainability as well, who's bringing not just these two together, but also the commercialized arm. There's a commercial value to sustainability today. So how can you use all the insights and data that you build over years? Because today, customers need it. So the ability to have the right strategy, right governance reporting uh, uh, and data, and also the commercialization piece makes the long-term, short-term start coming together much, much easier. So I'd like to turn a little bit of attention to other enablers and barriers. We've talked about value creation, about you know, being able to associate a dollar value on a particular initiative. But coming back to that moment five years ago, Andy, that you talked about, did that have any particular reason? Was it to do with, with regulation or something coming into place where you started to turn a focus to ESG-related risks and opportunities? Yeah, I, I think it, one of the triggers was, was TCFD um, because it, mm. in some ways it brought, brought it into the boardroom in, in a way. Uh, it, it brought the, the lens of needing to understand you know, the financial impact of actions we were taking as well as potentially actions we weren't taking. Um, and it required us to start setting out a long-term plan. Uh, and that led on to things like climate transition plan. Like, like Rebecca, we, we've taken that to, to our investors for approval a, a year or so ago as well. Um, but what that brought with it, I think, back to where we started the discussion is you know, once you start setting out these goals and the, these uh, disclosures around what you intend to do, amounts you're investing, the, the, the outcomes of those, it brings with it a need for assurance. And, and when we're talking to our investors, we're at the point where it doesn't matter whether it's a financial number or a non-financial number, they expect the same level of rigor and assurance around yeah, that. And exactly. um, a lot of the things we've been doing over the last few years, whether it's data, whether it's uh, the systems and tools we need it, the processes around it, and now, of course, the assurance debate. Uh, and we're in the midst of how do you go from limited assurance on a, a lot of metrics to reasonable assurance? Mm -hmm. And that sounds very technical, but actually it's a big, big, a big step in this world. Um, so I think that, that for us was, was the real trigger. But what it's meant is we have, like many companies, now we have a board committee focused on this topic. We have a separate responsible business charter setting out our targets. But from a CFO perspective, all of that now has crossed into the mainstream in terms of the rigor, the assurance, and, and, and so forth. Yeah. And Rebecca, when you're looking at the risks and opportunities, because one of the conversations we have around TCFD is, you know, risk, risk is something we look at over a short-term perspective. And when we're looking at climate-related risks and impacts, you're looking at a, a potentially very long-term and focusing hearts and minds on the fact that this is going to have a big financial impact. I mean, how did you work together to A, educate the finance teams or other way around um, and come to look at long-term risks in the organization? So you know, a couple of things I mentioned at the, at the very beginning. I, I'm involved with input into the risk register, assisting with corporate audit. So we're obviously then mapping out what are the short-term and long-term risks for the business, many of which are sustainability-oriented. Not just, I should add, we've largely talked about environmental issues today, but social as well. You know, We've made a big commitment around living wage at Unilever, and I think as... As, as, as a large multinational and for the same for, for many other companies, you know, there is an expectation as well to make sure that the S gets as much recognition as, as, as the E in, in, in the ESG reporting. Um, but I think that for the long term, I think you know, building on a lot of what you were just saying, 
it, this becomes part of strategic business planning. So, you know, yesterday, for an example, we have three hours uh, as the exec at Unilever looking at and getting really granular on, um, on net zero. So, you know, masses and masses of conversations, of course, over the past two years. Yesterday, we were going through a process, you know, with numbers attached to it to say, what do we need? If we, we've set a net zero target of 2039. So, by 2030, we're going through the process at the moment of resubmitting our science-based targets because we set them early. So although they're valid until the end of 24, we want to, to now resubmit. And saying, okay, from a granular business group perspective, we have five business groups across Unilever, so there's nutrition, ice cream, uh, beauty and wellbeing, personal care and home care. What are the levers that we will need to pull in each business group? So we've, you know, we've gone through that together with, with you know, bringing in other functions. R&D is a really big partner for me as well as finance as well. What is it that we're going to have to do across each of the business groups? Okay, we talk about net zero and home care. That means getting out of fossil fuel derived carbon. We need to think about propellants that we're using in, 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 in the beauty part of the business. So understanding you know, what are those three big levers that we would need to push and pull. And then, of course, what, what's the cost that's attached mm. to that? And what does that mean? And how do you then build that into the business plans? We've got a strap review, as I'm sure everyone has at this time of year, where we go to the board and talk about you know, our three-year plans. But, but actually now being re really granular about that and being able to, to, to put a price on it. And I think the other point as well, and, and you know, Rishi working with, with our big suppliers, you know, we, we have to also build in those costs across our value chain. So you know, we have what I call the, the onion at Unilever, you know, get your own house in order, work through your value chain, work through your brands, and then work in that kind of wider society ecosystem on advocacy and policy, et cetera. But you know, we need to work and build in the costs with our investors. You know, a living wage um, uh, commitment for us obviously has a huge impact on, on our supply chain. Yes. We're, you know, we're the scope three to, to the retailers. Mm. You know, so actually looking at how do those costs also impact right, right the way across your value chain and again building that into the business planning process. Mm -hmm. There's been a huge shift and a lot of changes in terms of European regulations coming in. Also in Germany, there's the Due Diligence Act, which is going to... <laughs> Be challenging for, for many organizations. Have you found that that's helped to change, change the focus internally? Yes, but I'm <laughs> not 100% uh, not sure always into the right direction. I think anyone in sustainability in Europe in particular, in European companies, has this sort of triple whammy the last two years of EU taxonomy, mm. Lieferketten-Sorgfaltspflichtengesetz, which is the human rights due diligence in Germany, which comes ahead of the European one, which is still coming ahead, but that's been uh, also in implementation uh, in the last year, plus now the CSRD, right? So you have a lot of resource, a lot of focus, a lot of also board level conversations around reporting and disclosure. And frankly, it's coming to a point where you really, they don't want to see you again, because you really always come with very complex, very complicated themes, that topics that end up with saying, well, what are we going to report on this? Not what are we going to do on this? I mean, that's, that's related, but at the moment, there's a lot of focus of what are you going to say, how are you going to report, who are you going to report to, who's going to do it, and how do you rope in different parts of the organization? So I, I am optimistic that once we've gone through this um, valley of tears, we, there will be something positive coming out of it, and it will strengthen the governance, the accountabilities, the systems behind it, the data as well. It will tie in also, again, give new emphasis, perhaps for companies that have not been so much exposed perhaps to the TCFD because not asset heavy or because not in those markets to actually really advance. So it will raise the level playing field. But I must say, I mean, Henkel has been really doing sustainability reporting for 30 years. So 30 years we have had an experience, we know how to do it, we had strategies for 10, 20 years, so this is nothing new. But all that stuff is, is coming down to smaller companies, to mm. SMEs as well. And I honestly, I've, I fail to see how they actually can, can live up to that rigor, even though I, I still want to maintain the idea of the regulation is right. Mm. It's just the practicality and getting it on the road is, is super hard. So um, again, I hope we speak next year again, <laughs> and we'll have a better story yeah. on this. But right now, we're really in the depth of it. And yeah. very briefly, because we're coming to the end of the session, just on the point around SMEs. I mean, do you think they can deal with well, the types of metrics? I'm actually really on? happy that one of us, I should be remiss not to have brought up SMEs, because um, whatever we do generally in sustainability, 
um, we have to make sure that also we respect the dignity of every actor within the, ec within the economy. And as with many new initiatives, often they can be most challenging um, for SMEs and mid-market size organizations. So this is why, say, uh, um, initiatives such as Bankers for Net Zero that were at normative heavily involved in here in the UK, uh, whereby initiatives such as the uh, SME Climate Hub, which we um, invest in, also companies like ourselves, it takes a full ecosystem, you know, making our software available to SMEs, so any of our customers can, their SMEs can consume our software um, and therefore provide the same um, accurate and get, provide the same input data, make reporting very simple, but also from a point of view of the full scopes one, two, and three um, coverage, that then the decisions that the largest companies within these value chains to the smallest companies within value chains are all working off the same baseline. And it's also something that we talk about a lot internally in our company. This is still an emerging market. So therefore, we collectively have to share our insight together and with governments to also make it simple and consumable. Well, I think it needs to emerge probably a lot faster than we'd like, <laughs> because we do have an imperative to take action, and that's what we've heard from all of you today, that dealing with ESG-related risks and opportunities is a business imperative. The CSO and the CFO working together is a marriage of necessity. It has to happen, and it can drive business opportunity and value to drive an, uh, innovation within the organization to take the businesses forward. So thank you very much for your insights. We're now heading into our networking break. So thank you very much. And thank you, Emily. Thank you to the panel. Thank you. <laughs>